All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the last panel of the last day of a two-day conference, uh, which can be exhausting, but I'm excited about this panel. And since I know we have, I'm told, uh, a large-ish audience tuning in, I do want to say to the audience tuning in virtually that for those of you who have missed the previous day and a half of conversation, that I hope that you'll go back and have a look at the very fascinating discussions that we've had. They're up on the Carnegie Endowment website, carnegieendowment.org, and also on YouTube. Now, for this last panel, we're going to talk about the role of the United States in both of these regions, a country that has a long history, uh, deep ties, and uh, some intensive and interesting relationships, actually, in both uh, parts of the world. And that springs from a few sources. Um, for one thing, the United States has been intrinsically a commercial maritime power since 1784, when the Empress of China, which was a three-masted, square-rigged sailing ship, sailed out of New York Harbor around the Cape of Good Hope and up through the Indian Ocean, establishing an American presence in the Indian Ocean on the way to China. Now, second, the United States has military facilities and bases in both parts of the world. Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, and then, of course, Guam and uh, elsewhere in the Pacific. Um, third, the United States is a resident power in the Pacific. It has territorial and commonwealth relationships uh, with countries, the Northern Marianas, American Samoa, um, and so on. But finally, and actually most interestingly in some ways, the United States has a very unique set of relationships in the Pacific through the so-called Compacts of Free Association with Palau, with the Federated States of Micronesia, um, and with the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So uh, we're going to use this panel in that very interesting context to talk a little bit about American interests, goals, tools, strategies, and partnerships. And to do that, I have a fabulous panel of three that's joining me uh, from the current and former administration. They also happen to be three good friends, so I'm excited we could uh, have you do this. Um, we have on uh, the screen for me, and probably on the screen for the virtual audience, Edgard Kagan joining us from Washington and looking very good, if I may say so. Edgard, you look good. Um, Edgard is a special assistant to President Biden and senior director for East Asia and Oceania at the National Security Council. He has deep experience in India as well. He was deputy chief of mission at the American Embassy in New Delhi, principal officer at the American Consulate General in Mumbai, has experience uh, with China as well. Lisa Curtis, former special assistant to President Trump and senior director for South and Central Asian Affairs, also on the National Security Council, currently the head of the Indo-Pacific Initiative at the uh, Center for a New American Security, but Lisa also has deep experience across government. We first met you in the State Department, I think, in the Bureau of South Asian Affairs then, not yet South and Central Asian Affairs. And then to my immediate left, my old friend Randy Shriver, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, also has experience at the State Department, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State East Asia, former Chief of Staff to Deputy Secretary of State Rich Armitage, and chairman of the Project 2049 Institute. So, team, welcome. And um, I thought, you guys know me, I'm kind of old fashioned, so I always like, before we get to policies and tools, I thought we'd start with American interests, and we can start with a wide angle and then work our way down. This is an islands dialogue, but I thought before we get to the islands, uh, because these islands are quite diverse, what the two regions have in common is, of course, the water. And I was talking about the United States as a maritime power. Um, there's a lot of ocean in the world, not just these two ocean regions. So I thought maybe, Randy, you're an ex-Navy guy, so I thought I'd start with you. Maybe you could talk a little bit about American maritime interests, encompassing both the military piece and the commercial piece. Sure. How should we think about American interests in maritime spaces, and then fold these two regions in for us a little bit? Sure. Well, thanks, Evan, and it's great to be here. Appreciate the invitation from Carnegie and the Susquehanna Peace Foundation, and it's great to be uh, with this panel, you said representing two administrations, but all four of us served in one administration. I worked with Ed Gard and, and uh, Lisa and you in the Bush administration. So always one team, one fight, right? Um, well, look, yesterday, uh, uh, Minister Khalil said, uh, ocean is our life, water is our life. I think that's true of the United States as well. A bigger country, bigger landmass in between our two great oceans. Uh, but really, it's just as critical to, to us. You gave some of the history, or at least the earliest portion of our history. We're absolutely dependent on the oceans for 
our prosperity and for our security. That's been true from the beginning. But as we've uh, grown as an economic presence, as a, as a, a global power, uh, that sort of definition of, of which waters affect our prosperity and security has also grown. Um, obviously, we have also adopted through the growth of certain capabilities a, a particular role for the global commons and the maritime commons as, as a uh, naval service, which comprised of our U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and, and Coast Guard, as a naval service that takes on the uh, responsibility of, of really being the security guarantor of these global commons, these maritime spaces. Um, now, the interesting thing is our, our overarching objective is to keep uh, maritime global commons free and open. It's not to control, it's not to direct the activities therein, um, but the, the, the sort of interesting uh, uh, follow on then is if your goal is free and open, free and open almost by definition also creates some vulnerabilities and, and ways that those who have other interests and intent can, can exploit the free and open nature of it. And so uh, as we've pursued these objectives across the global commons and maritime spaces, uh, we've seen the need increasingly to have uh, military capabilities through our naval service uh, to prevent malign actors from changing that, that sort of free and open quality of, of these uh, maritime areas. And principally now we talk about China and, and, and Russia, but also a whole range of malign activities that can take advantage of the free and open nature of, of the maritime spaces, uh, human traffickers, uh, narco uh, smugglers, terrorists, extremist groups, and the like. So uh, as we've grown our capabilities and taken on this special responsibility as sort of global guarantor of these uh, maritime spaces, we've had to adapt uh, our capabilities to be appropriate and fit for the mission uh, to deal with all these things. And of course, through that, uh, we find partnerships absolutely vital, those that, that share our interest in maintaining this free and open quality. So I just close with, um, when we did our Indo-Pacific strategy report in the last administration, which until they released theirs, I'll consider it the, uh, still the guiding document, uh, we talked about the three Ps, preparedness, which was about lethality, but the, the next two Ps are all about uh, how we maintain the free and open qualities of the maritime spaces. We talk about uh, partnerships and allies, and we talk about promoting networks and, and promoting a networked region so that we can uh, be aware of what's happening in the maritime spaces and be able to respond in a collective manner. So I, I think that's uh, where our interests are. They're, they're extraordinary, and, and um, I think it's uh, something that, as far as I understand, this administration is also committed to, and so I, I think we're, we're still in the business of looking for capabilities and partners to ensure that. Oh, that's great. And Edgar, that's a good place to turn to you, actually, because as Randy said, there's continuity across administrations on many aspects of American interests, commitment to the maritime spaces, commitment to this idea of Indo-Pacific, actually, as a framing construct. So we have two sets of islands in this dialogue. Indo, the part, some of them are in the Indo, the Indian Ocean. Some of them are in the Pacific. And I, I don't want to force or over-contrive the connections between them. But I do want to get a sense from you of the extent to which the Biden administration is thinking in a seamless way uh, about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific in terms of strategic challenges, strategic interests, maybe it's policy tools. And use that as a frame to then drill down a little bit and talk to us about how the administration is thinking uh, about the region, about island spaces, but particularly about Oceania, because I know it's in your portfolio. Thank you very much, Evan. And I really want to thank you, um, the uh, Carnegie and also the Susquehanna Peace Foundation for putting this on. It's, I think, very timely and very, very useful to have this kind of sort of focusing on a set of issues that, as we all know, in government, one of the challenges is that the urgent usually drives out the essential. And one of the challenges in terms of dealing with islands, dealing with this set of issues, has been that very often they are not at a crisis stage. And so it is harder to marshal the will to really focus on them. And I think that it's great to see uh, Randy and Lisa and, and, and you as well, Evan. You know, all of us have worked in a variety of administrations and have seen the challenges of marshaling sustained U.S. attention to these issues. And I mean, frankly, I focus much more on the Pacific Islands 
um, including my uh, Obama administration when I served as a deputy assistant secretary. And one of the areas I worked on was the Pacific Islands. And it is just tremendously difficult. It's been tremendously difficult to focus sustained attention. And I want, really want to commend uh, Randy and Lisa because I think that one of the things that the previous administration did was step up the level of focus and attention to the islands, um, particularly true with the Pacific Islands. Uh, but I think also a great deal of attention in the Indian Ocean, I think particularly with Maldives. And so I think across the board, what you see is a growing recognition that spans a number of administrations with the importance of stepping up our game. And I think that it's very important to understand that in terms of the context of how the Biden administration looks at it, which is that we want to continue the previous administration's efforts of focusing much more sustained and coherent efforts to step up our engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And that, you know, we've worked in a number of areas. You've seen the outreach to traditional allies and partners, um, ranging from Japan and Korea, in Southeast Asia, India. Uh, we are also working to step up our engagement in the Pacific. Um, and I think that this is something that's a challenge. We, you know, are, are very committed to deepening this. We have a broad range of interests. The strategic circumstances are evolving. And I think that, you know, a, a set of issues that 20 years ago, as I think all four of us know well, it was very hard to get attention for. It's now much easier. But translating that into the kind of sustained engagement and programs that allow us to genuinely step up our game and really have broader and deeper relations with, I think, very important partners is a challenge. And we're working on that now. I think we see this very much as, you know, when we think of the Indo-Pacific, there are a number of different pieces. But one of them for us that's very important is the Pacific. Um, and you will note that when we did the, you know, split and created a separate China directorate um, in the National Security Council, which I think was a recognition of the degree to which the issues in China um, were taking up time and energy and that we wanted to be able to do that and at the same time continue the more traditional outreach to allies and partners and with the rest of the region. One of the things that we did is we specifically used the term Oceania. So I, my title is the senior director for East Asia and Oceania, which was a very deliberate effort to signal that we recognize that this area is very, very important to us. And I think that we have a, a set of issues that we have a great deal in common on. At the same time, we have very significant challenges. And I think that one of them um, is marshaling the focus that we need to bring all tools of our government to bear. Another is making sure that we recognize that we have real opportunities that stem from some of these challenges. So a good example is COVID. Obviously, that's a huge challenge. And I think it's impossible to overestimate the impact of that COVID can have in very small islands, um, island states. At the same time, we have been able to work closely with our island partners, our Pacific partners, and, and with other partners to try and ensure the flow of vaccines to the region. Uh, and I think that we also see climate as an area where not only is it something of tremendous importance to them, but it's also an area where we are able and interested in working with them and also working with other partners in the region, such as New Zealand, such as Australia, and also Japan and uh, the ROK. And so that trying to meld together the work with the other allies and partners who have interests in the Pacific um, with, at the same time, uh, better outreach to the Pacific and dealing with some of the challenges that are coming up has been our main focus right now. That's great. So I'm going to want to drill down on the Pacific specifically and also on some of the tools, and I'm glad you mentioned tools. But I, I want to stay on this concept of whether we're talking about a unity or not for a second. So I'm going to ask this question to Lisa, but then Edgar or Randy, you guys should weigh in on this too. So um, uh, maybe we're contriving something here, maybe we're not. But if I think about what links Indian Ocean Islands with Pacific Islands, there are maybe four ways to think about what might foster a unity. And we were, Edgar, you weren't with us then, but we were chatting a little bit about this before. So one is common geography, right? So that's the idea of Indo-Pacific, that there's this large expanse of geography, Indo-Pacific, there's a strategic or an economic or a conceptual unity, and therefore they're all part of one seamless set of strategic ideas. That's one way to think about it. It may or may not be strong. Second is common set of problems. 
that they're in disparate geographies, but the problems are very similar, and the problem sets that they're dealing with, fisheries, piracy, climate change, require a United States that's engaged with one or the other or both regions to think in terms of a conceptual unit because they're dealing with some of the same problems. A third would be common frameworks. Randy and I were discussing before that Indo-PACOM, for instance, the United States Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii has responsibility for Pacific, but also some countries in the Indian Ocean. So at the Indo-PACOM Chief of Defense Conference, for instance, you have chiefs of defense from countries in the Indian Ocean, island countries, but also the Pacific. And as Randy was pointing out to me, we've used regional frameworks, for example, in the Pacific, to bring the Indo-PACOM commander together with uh, the Pacific states. So common geography, common problems, common frameworks. And then the fourth would be common challenges, problems of strategic competition, where the United States is thinking because it sees some of the same problems. So this is really directed at Lisa in the first instance, but um, do any of those make sense? Um, and even if we don't contrive a common geography, is there a basis for senior US officials, you were a National Security Council senior director, to think strategically about island nations in the two places in a similar way, or at least in a complementary way? Yeah, I, I do think it makes sense to think strategically of the island nations of the Indo-Pacific uh, for the reasons that you stated, because they face the same challenges, whether it be climate change, illegal fishing, um, and, and other issues. But when it comes down to it, and, and if we're talking about investing diplomatic uh, financial resources into a region, I do think it's important to have a specific strategy for the different regions. Um, and I say this based on my personal experience working as senior director uh, for South Asia. And we always talked about how we needed an Indian Ocean region strategy, but we somehow we never found time to, to get around to it. We had a South Asia strategy, we had a Central Asia strategy, we actually had a Sri Lankan strategy, as I pointed out earlier today. Um, and I, I do hope that uh, this administration really can drill down and, and get to an Indian Ocean region strategy because I, I think it's very important. Traditionally, India has been skeptical of US involvement in what it considers its backyard or you know, its region. However, I think this is changing. I think that uh, India does see a positive role for not only the US, but Japan and Australia in the Indian Ocean region. Um, we've seen a small step toward that. Uh, the fact that the US refueled uh, it, one of its P8s for the first time, made a refueling stop in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands last fall. Um, also, India is working with Japan on a renewable energy project on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So I think we see a, a gradual opening to uh, more US involvement in this region. And I think what Edgar said is completely right. When you're um, working on these issues in the administration, you're always driven by the crises. Um, and that's why we have to think about, you know, putting a strategy in place so that we do devote those necessary resources and diplomacy and that we're, we're kind of set up in these regions because it, it is about access. I think Randy spelled out very well what our interests are. Um, in the maritime domain. But, you know, I think about it in terms of access and, and the U.S. needs to continue to have um, access in both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's also about working with these countries so that they can maintain their own independence and sovereignty. Uh, we talked about that a lot this morning with the Sri Lankan Foreign Secretary. So, you know, the, these are the, the interests of the U.S. I think it's access and making sure these countries maintain their independence, sovereignty. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that we do need sort of to think about the islands strategically and think about what their needs are because we have to connect our interests and their interests and needs in order to have effective diplomacy. But then when it comes down to you know, what we're actually going to, going to do, then I think we do need to think about the regions a little bit separately because the issues are different. The US has a different 
history and relationship with the Pacific Islands than it does. Like I said, India has been the dominant power in the Indian Ocean region. Um, the U.S. is coming in, you know, kind of, kind of new into this region. Uh, so that, that's the way I would look at it. Yeah, Randy, Edgar, do either of you want to take a question? Are there points of reference that are useful from one to the other? Or yeah, how I, should we th think about it? I think there are. And I think you use the term as a, as a complementary. And I think this sort of thought exercise, if you will, can be useful as we look at common challenges, toolkit, find out what's worked well. And, but I think ultimately you're going to have to disaggregate, even by individual country in, in many cases, as we were talking about before, uh, if you look across the Indo-Pacific region at island nations, I mean, you've got the return of foreign fighters in the Maldives, you've got the Diego Garcia, Chagos Islands issue in Mauritius, you've got the China-Taiwan uh, competition in, in some of these Pacific states. But I think you also have to dis disaggregate by region. Lisa mentioned the history. Um, we, we have a, a, a legacy, particularly from World War II, but we also have a legacy from uh, having U.S. territories in the Pacific, which ultimately gained their independence, but in some cases uh, re uh, remained tied to us through compacts of free association, as you mentioned. Those are unique relationships, and we can talk more about that, but um, it gives us a certain kind of access in Marshall Islands. We have the Kwajalein facility. We are looking at developing facilities in Palau, particularly for uh, awareness purposes. Uh, but we also have responsibilities. The Compact of Free Association actually obliges us to uh, have a direct hand in the security and defense of these countries and in their foreign policy in certain instances when it crosses over into to defense and security issues. Right. So, Edgar, maybe that's a good point of departure for you because the Compact is a tool that the U.S. has that has implications for strategic competition, among other things, because we have uh, other powers. I have one particular power in mind, China, that's becoming more present in the region. But maybe that's a good point of departure for you to talk a little bit about how you're thinking about the toolkit that the United States has, particularly in the Pacific. What are the tools that you lean on as you try to implement the kind of vision that you talked a little bit about before? Thanks, Evan. I'd just like to go back a little bit just to follow up on one thing that, sure. um, that both Lisa and Randy sort of alluded to, which is I think that one of the differences, and I think this became very apparent to me in my time in India, um, is that there is a level of expectation in the Pacific about the U.S. role because of our history, because of our engagement, that is very different than in the Indian Ocean. Um, this isn't to say that we don't have important interests in both, but I think that the level of expectation from the, uh, of the United States in the Pacific is quite significant and quite different. Um, and it means also that people are looking to us much more as a primary player than I think has historically been the case in uh, the Indian Ocean for the reasons that Lisa uh, mentioned. So I think that that creates a different dynamic. Whereas even if we do exactly equally well in both places, and as you know from your time in government, that would already be saying a lot, um, that the truth is that the expectation in the Pacific is such that there would still be a sense that we should be doing more um, because of the history. In terms of the toolkit, I mean, I think that you know, the, the challenge is that the things that matter in the, this area vary dramatically from country to country. I mean, the truth is that we have a tendency to think of the Pacific Islands as all being roughly the same, but as all three of you know, the differences are immense. Um, the difference between a country which is essentially, you know, one island versus another spread over an archipelago, the differences in population, you know, are, and the impact that, that has, the difference between Papua New Guinea and the Solomons on one hand, and then Palau on the other, are really significant. And so one of the challenges that we've always had is it's hard enough to get, it, to get sustained attention and effort. But the truth is that you need to, it, it, to really differentiate between the different islands because the situations are so different. So I think that the toolkits that we're looking at are, one, the historical ties and people-to-people -people ties. And I think that often we tend to underestimate the impact that has. I think it's still quite great. And there is a deep-seated sense of connection to the U.S. that in areas that go beyond like, the compact states, where obviously there's a particularly strong connection. I think also the economic and security roles are extraordinarily important. Randy mentioned it. We are still viewed as a critical security a player and guarantor in much of the region. And I remember traveling in 2012 
um, to the region um, and visiting like seven states. And one thing that was really striking was in each of we're traveling with the commander of the Pacific Fleet, the extraordinary memories that in each of these places people had for the U.S. Navy and the appreciation of what the U.S. Navy had done in the United States as a whole, but particularly the U.S. Navy. I think the Coast Guard is an extraordinarily important tool, one that, you know, we are looking to see if there's ways of expanding the presence and the level of engagement because, you know, the issues that really matter to countries in the Pacific in many cases are much more aligned with the Coast Guard set of issues, you know, control over uh, exclusive economic zones, dealing with fishing, dealing with maritime domain awareness, than what we would consider to be more traditionally Navy or military functions. Um, also looking for ways in which we can expand commercial engagement, uh, clean energy. I mean, you know, I think that it's worth noting that, you know, not only are these countries extremely affected by rising waters, but also many of them are extremely impacted by the desire to have more efficient, cleaner energy that's more readily available. So I think in all these things, we have a pretty wide set of tools that we can apply. The hard thing is marshalling them in a sustained and coherent fashion. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, Lisa and Randy, I see Randy nodding. Um, you know, these are things that every administrator or the last three administrations have all talked about doing. They've all proven harder to do in practice than they were in theory. And I think that the challenge for us is we sort of know, thanks to the good work that's been done in recent years, what we should be doing. The key is, are we able to execute? And we're doing our best to do that. Yeah. So let, let's parse the toolkit a little bit because I, I, I want to come back. I want to come back around and spend a little time on the economic tools. Because, Edgar, you've missed the, the day and a half, but from particularly the representatives of island states, there have been a pretty consistent set of themes around, not surprisingly, climate, but also growth, development, opportunity, investment, employment. So we'll come back to that. But let's start with the security tools. Um, you mentioned Coast Guard. Um, I think it was the uh, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs from Maldives yesterday who talked a little bit about Coast Guard. Yeah. Um, and he was saying just the sheer scope of the challenge is so great that they can't cover it all, which creates opportunities for the United States and for other partners, by the way, uh, to help build capacity and uh, provide assistance. Um, Randy, you've worked on some of this stuff, and I'm wondering if on the Coast Guard element in particular you want to jump in. Absolutely, thanks. Um, so when I took my first trip to the Pacific Island area as Assistant Secretary of Defense, I, I was gonna be really smart, right? Because I knew that only three Pacific Islands had militaries, uh, Solomon Islands, uh, Tonga, and Fiji. So I'm gonna bring a representative of the Coast Guard with me because I, I understand the region really well. What, what I didn't fully appreciate till the person that was on the delegation with me started talking is just how small our Coast Guard is. It's a great tool. There are more people in New York City Police Department where we are today than there are in the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard, the whole budget for the United States Coast Guard it barely qualifies as a rounding error in, in DOD's budget. It's about $13 billion. Uh, so, and you look at uh, Coast Guard cutters that are of medium or high endurance, around 40. And so when you look at it as a tool for international engagement, it is an extraordinarily scarce resource. And I would love to quadruple the size of the US Coast Guard for the purposes of international engagement. Turns out the Coast Guard has other missions, <laughs> search and rescue, drug, uh, counter drug. They're very busy here in the United States. So using it as a tool, it's absolutely the right tool. And when we show up, we're greeted with open arms because the mission set is so critical to these countries that we wanna be good partners to. And they're terrific programs like uh, shiprider programs. So a US Coast Guard cutter can take a representative from the host government out on patrol, and by virtue of that person being aboard, they can exercise you know, legal authorities in their sovereign territory, whereas just a US Coast Guard cutter on its own couldn't. These are great programs, but this is a really small service. And um, if we're gonna get serious with, with the Coast Guard as a tool for international engagement, we have to we have to invest a lot more so that that tool is is available. Do we train in addition to deploy and equip? You know, for instance, at the Coast Guard Academy, do we have do we have cadets from the uh, from Pacific nations or from Indian Ocean nations? We do, and thanks for raising that. That's another so shiprider programs, training, all of this is is a part of it, and I think it's a extraordinarily valuable tool, but again, a limited resource. Okay. Um, 
Can I, um, I do want to jump to the economic tools a little bit, because Lisa, for one thing, you had Sri Lanka in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. You had this very ambitious compact, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation compact negotiation that uh, fell apart. Uh, if you want to weigh in on why that fell apart, you can. But you know, it was interesting, in prepping for this session, I, I took a look at two of the most advertised tools the US has, not least for competing with China, which is doing a lot of project finance in various parts of the world. Um, one is uh, the new Development Finance Corporation, the DFC, uh, and the other is the Millennium Challenge, which goes back to the Bush administration. Um, first the Millennium Challenge account, then the corporation. So when I looked at the DFC portfolio, <laughs> um, it looked like there was a framework agreement with Tuvalu um, which was largely aspirational in nature. It was kind of an, an investment incentive agreement. In other words, designed to mobilize private capital. And having been the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central Asia, a region where it's pretty tough to mobilize foreign capital, outside a couple of extractive sectors in particularly one country, Kazakhstan, that can be a high bar. So I wondered first on the DFC side whether you thought we were using that tool uh, to maximum effect. Um, particularly, Lisa, reflecting you, your experiences, but then particularly your very direct experiences with MCC. Mm -hmm. um, there's invitations to threshold agreements to the Solomon Islands and Kiribati, and that looked like it was about the extent of the uh, MCC portfolio in the Pacific. And I didn't see much in the Indian Ocean either. So I'm curious, reflecting on the Sri Lanka experience, are we underweighting these tools? Um, and if we are, why is that? And if we're not, is it just a function of the nature of the investment challenge? Well, regarding the DFC, I think that is a great tool. And you know, the fact that it was given you know, more money, doubled the budget, more authorities to be able to do uh, equity financing, you know, this is really very useful. And I, I think one of the best things that DFC uh, did do in the Indo-Pacific during uh, my time in the administration was develop this uh, MOU that we heard about um, earlier. Uh, from Mr. Suzuki, uh, the, you know, JBIC partnering with Australia's DFAT, partnering with USDFC uh, to, you know, push back against the Belt and Road Initiative, to be able to come together to offer infrastructure projects. Now, unfortunately, there, there's only been one project that really got off the ground, and that was the financing of the subsea cable for Palau, right. uh, which is important. But frankly, you know, I would like to see that relationship, that MOU between the three countries do a lot more. One problem, I think, with the DFC is they haven't brought the staffing up. Even though they have doubled the budget, uh, what we see is uh, they need to, to increase the staffing to be able to do the work to get out there and, and make these things happen. Of course, they also need to get somebody in place, a leader in place. Hopefully that will, will happen soon um, because the DFC is a, is a great tool for the United States and it is something that is underutilized right now. Now, in terms of the MCC, uh, the Sri Lankan story, it, it really is tragic. You know, uh, four or five years of effort by both governments to develop this compact, you know, $480 million grant assistance for the Sri Lankan people. Um, but it got politicized. And we, we heard this morning from uh, the Sri Lankan Foreign Secretary, you know, that the people of Sri Lanka, I think there was a lot of misunderstanding. We can talk about whether that was propaganda, disinformation, just politicization. Um, but it, it really is a, is a tragic example of uh, something that could have benefited the Sri Lankan people and it was you know, something that was forfeited, forfeited by the Sri Lankan government uh, themselves. And unfortunately, we see something similar happening in Nepal with the MCC compact that again has been worked on for the last you know, four or five years. And it's a great opportunity for the Nepali people but they are, it's become politicized. And so nobody wants to come out in support of it. And they talk about it threatening the sovereignty of the country. So this, this is a problem that has come up in the South Asian context in particular. And it's, it's, it's not helpful and something that, that we need to get ahead of. And that's why I say we need a strategy. We need to um, make sure that the US is explaining you know, why these economic tools are helpful for the country, that it's not about infringing on the country's sovereignty, 
Uh, we, we need to figure this out. We need to do a better job. But there is one other economic tool I want to talk about, and Randy will remember this, uh, in the case of the Maldives after the 28 election that brought Pe President Soli to power. Um, we were able to offer our technical assistance in managing their debt crisis. Uh, they had, were very much over indebted, particularly to China. And so we were able to you know, bring in Treasury and other economic experts, technical experts to do the forensics and to help them manage that issue. So that's, that's another form of um, assistance we can provide, our technical assistance to help these countries that have gotten underwater uh, and help them figure out how to, how to get ahead of that. Can I push you on this sovereignty thing for a second? I mean, I've seen, we've seen those debates in lots of contexts in lots of countries. How much of this is an American problem? In other words, that the United States is viewed through a political prism in country X or country Y? Or is it the nature of the assistance being foreign assistance? Because if it's the former, then that begins to flow us into the issue of partnerships. Because for instance, our colleague, Mr. Suzuki, from the Japan Bank of International Cooperation, JBIC this morning, talked about just how robust actually the JBIC portfolio is in the Pacific, but also in some of the Indian Ocean states. So if it's more of an American issue rather than a foreign assistance issue, that argues for leaning on partnerships much more. And sometimes maybe folding behind Japan or by others and letting them be in the lead. So I'm for you and for, and for Edgar. Actually. If I can just jump in, yeah. I think it's an information war. Okay, I think, talk about that. Well, I think that, uh, that, you know, there is an effort to, you know, try to block out the U.S. Uh, from the region. And I think it's probably a very sophisticated effort. Um, and I think we need to do a better job in our messaging. And, and we need to, to understand what the political dynamics are, and then we need to work very hard on our information um, because I, I think it's more due to an information war. Randy, you may disagree, Edgar. Oh. Yeah, Edgar, is that, is that a challenge for you as you're trying to tell America's Ooh. story and lean on these tools? I think that the short answer is yes. I think that I would also add something, which I think is really, I mean, just referring to Millennium Challenge Corporation as well as to the DFC. You know, as Lisa said, DFC is a relatively new organization. It was basically, you know, taking uh, OPIC, part of USAID, cobbling uh, things together. And I think it has tremendous potential. I think some of the work they're doing now is very impressive. We are working with them to expand what they're doing in the Indo-Pacific. We think they're a critical player and, and critical partner and, frankly, tool from our standpoint. I think you have to be realistic that the nature of organizations is it is very hard to significantly ramp up quickly. And that's essentially what DFC is being asked to do. So I think it's, you know, I, I'm incredibly optimistic because what we've seen is that given the challenges they face, they've actually been quite responsive in a number of areas. And I'm confident that they will be doing more and they fully get the importance of the region. Um, in terms of MCC, I think we have to be honest, like things that we saw as a feature of the MCC are not necessarily viewed as a feature of it is a positive feature by some of the, our partners. I mean, the reality is that what we saw as a very fundamental thing is there was going to be a compact and it was going to be very clear what countries were going to be expected to do. It was designed to be very, very transparent. It was designed to have very clear markers that would basically, to the extent possible, depoliticize um, the, the various steps was, uh, associated with both performance and disbursement. Um, but the truth is that I think in both the cases that Lisa mentioned, that's not necessarily viewed as a positive thing by everyone. Um, and the truth is there's a lot of conditionality. And so when we're sort of competing, if you will, which in, in many ways we sort of are, against assistance which has remarkably few conditions um, and you know, a wide range of benefits, that conditionality, which we saw as important in the conceptual stage of the MCC to ensure that there was buy-in and full commitment by the host government, 
suddenly becomes perhaps a little bit less attractive. So I think that, you know, my view is the MCC remains a very, very useful tool. We're, we just signed a compact, for instance, with Mongolia, which I admit is definitely not a small island. Um, but <laughs> though they, would, they would argue that they are a, an island surrounded um, by two very, very different neighbors. Um, but we signed a compact with them, which they are very positive about. So I think a lot has to do with what the choices are and how it's presented, as Lisa says. Um, but I think it also has to do with what host governments see as being in their interests. I think that more broadly on the issue of tools, I mean, ultimately, the most powerful tools that we have are trade and private sector engagement, private sector investment. And those are things that, you know, some islands have done very well on, some have done less well on. The islands face particularly significant challenges under COVID, and I think that we have to acknowledge, you know, like the impact that COVID has on a place that's really dependent on tourism is devastating. Um, the other thing that's a real challenge for us, and I've seen some things in the press about uh, diplomatic presence and engagement. I mean, the truth is, it is a lot harder to cover island states regionally um, when there aren't flights or when it's incredibly hard to get in and out because of COVID restrictions. And I think that all these things point to the fact that we are dealing with a set of very difficult challenges right now, but that also create an appetite for finding ways to work with the United States and with other partners. And so our goal is to try and take advantage of that. Um, and particularly as countries are looking to rebuild their economies, to deal with COVID, those are things that we believe that we and our partners, and I think Lisa's absolutely right, and you're absolutely right, Evan, to, to highlight the value of working with key partners like Japan, like Australia. I would add New Zealand, and we've had extensive conversations with the Kiwis on this. India, about the um, Indian Ocean region, uh, and the ROK. If you look we, in our, um, when the ROK President Moon visited, we actually had something about working together more in the Pacific, um, which we've started to do with them. So I think that the, all these things reflect the fact that there's no one size fits all solution. Like, you know, for instance, we're working on renewing the compacts, which is, as those of you who've been involved with the compacts, the free association, not the MCC compacts. Yeah, just I'm sorry, the compact, yeah. I apologize, compacts, free association. That's one line of effort. We have other lines of effort that are working with Japan, working with Australia, working with both, working with New Zealand, working with the ROK, as well as doing things ourselves. And so I think that in all these things, the key is to be as nimble as possible, engage directly, make clear that this matters to us, get higher level attention, and find a way to get the kind of budgetary support to allow a more sustained, more regular engagement. So you made an interesting point. You made, all of you have made this point, actually. You keep talking about the diversity, right? Um, the, the islands are very different from each other in a lot of ways. And that's true, like, let's just take the Pacific. These islands are quite different from one another. And that, that actually flows into a question from somebody who's in the virtual audience. They essentially say, uh, how should the US think about working individually with countries as opposed to jointly or collectively? with countries. And I may actually throw this back to Edgar. I know you've been speaking. But as, as you're thinking about US engagement in the Pacific, which you said, I hate to say step up, because I know Australia has a Pacific step up. <laughs> but if you want to do an analogous American step up, literally to step up engagement, um, how do you get the balance right amid all that diversity between working with countries individually and having not just regional strategies, but collective engagement. Um, you mentioned trade. I noticed the US has a lot of trade and investment framework agreements with individual countries, actually, in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific. But in one or two cases, the US has had regional TIFAs as opposed to individual TIFAs. Um, is that the right vehicle, or are there other ways to think more jointly as opposed to disparately, notwithstanding the diversity? Look, it's a great question, Evan, and I think the answer is we need to do both. We need to be looking at how we can work with groupings because obviously it's more efficient for us. It's easier to get the level of attention that we need, and it's easier to work with partners. Um, and we need to, at the same time, strengthen the bilateral because ultimately, you know, I think we need to remember every single one of these countries has a very unique, very proud history. And that, you know, the traditional sort of mechanism of dealing with them in a group through a single meeting um, when they're all together 
is something that they'll put up with, but that's not really the preferred way of managing their relations with us. So that, you know, the problem, and all of you who've been in government know, is that it is, you know, hard to carve out the time to have these level of engagements. We are doing our best and, you know, we're lucky because we're building, I think, on some sustained efforts by, you know, several administrations now. But it's, it's always going to be a challenge. I think the key for me is that it's got to be variable. There are situations where we're going to be more effective dealing with a country bilaterally, others where we'll be more effective dealing with a group of countries, with the U.S. dealing with, like, you know, a grouping, or where we'll be more effective working with partners. Um, and I think that the key is being nimble enough to sort of recognize the difference and being able to decide this is the best way to do this right now to deal with this problem. But And, and I would give you an example, the Palau Cable. Um, is a good example of deciding, okay, here's a challenge, here's a way of, in which we can try and solve it by working with others. There are other situations where the Australians may have the lead or where the Kiwis may have the lead or where, you know, we will take the lead because of a special set of circumstances. I think that, you know, the, the key is to be nimble. And as you know, it's very hard to do that in government. Almost everything else is easier in government than being nimble. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a question from the virtual audience about China. So, Randy, talk to me about China. China is, uh, well, they're everywhere. They're a global player. They're certainly in these two regions. Um, and they're leaning on a set of tools, too, some of which have come up either directly or by illusion, including project finance tools. Um, how should the U.S. be thinking about China, first, in terms of these regions, in terms of the global challenge that it sees? Um, but then don't just think globally where these countries are proxies for the U.S. competition with China. What are the specific problems, challenges, opportunities vis-a-vis -vis China that the U.S. ought to be thinking about? Well, first of all, how we should think about it, I think we should be very clear-eyed and, and understand what their objectives are and what they're trying to accomplish in, in uh, their strategy and their engagements, their toolkit. And it's clear that a big part of this is not just better relations between China and country X or more respect for China in region Y. It is to diminish our role, uh, change the overall security, economic, diplomatic architecture of these regions, and to fundamentally make uh, these regions more deferential to China's authoritarian model and its interests. And the way that they are pursuing that, in fact, are things that will undermine the free and open order, which we seek to support and sustain and promote. So this puts us fundamentally at, at odds with China. And I think it's important to have that context because we don't begrudge countries wanting good relations with China. We want good relations with China. We don't begrudge countries wanting trade and investment because we certainly have uh, a great deal of that ourselves. It's about uh, where China is trying to drive those relationships and, and what they're trying to accomplish through their engagement. Um, how should we, so I, I think it's a combination of continuing to shine a light on the, the activities and the outcomes. Um, Lisa talked before about uh, the, the debt situation that some of China's engagements created in a, a particular country. In fact, that's a pretty common story. Mm -hmm. And I think we've done a little better job of shining a light on that. But, you know, m most recipient countries have a pretty good understanding of what's happening in, inside their country. It's not like we're necessarily uh, bringing new narratives uh, to the fore when we go to these capitals, but it's, it's setting really a baseline for a wider audience to understand what China's objectives are, what their engagement is producing. Shining light on that, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you can't beat something with nothing. You have to have high quality engagement, high quality programs of your own. And I think when you look at the magnitude of investment that's required, we have to do that alongside partners. So I'd very much echo, underscore what was said earlier about working with Japan, Australia, Korea, New Zealand. Now, the interesting thing about that is, you know, we sort of came in in, in, in the last administration and said, you know, this sort of division of labor is no longer uh, appropriate or optimal for the challenges we face. So. You know, it used to be the United States takes care of Micronesia, uh, Australia takes care of uh, Polynesia, and, and uh, New Zealand does Melanesia. But, but as we tried to broaden it and say we're going to do all of this, 
you know, oh, we've got to renew the compact. So we better pay attention to Micronesia and we better pay attention to where we have military facilities. We better take care of that. And as Australia did the step up, they looked very closely to their uh, near abroad and, and things in proximity to, to Australia. And the same was true of New Zealand's reset. So we're, all, we're almost sort of forcing back into a division of labor which may not be the worst thing when, when you get to your question. How do you mm. actually do things regionally, but also how do you, in each individual case, respective case, prove that you understand what the problems are, that you're bringing tools that are appropriate and fit for the challenge, and that uh, you can be flexible and agile no matter how hard it, it is, as Edgar rightly, rightfully points out. You want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think the way I think about the regional versus the bilateral is for the U.S. to have a strategy to compete effectively with China in the Indo-Pacific and to be able to manage the China challenge that we're facing, we need to think regionally and we need to be able to deal regionally. Um, but in order to get the buy-in from the countries, you have to be able to deal bilaterally because as Edgar said, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the bilateral touch, the bilateral relationship, what, what comes from that. So that's the way I think about it. But, but building on what Randy said about uh, thinking about China and different aspects of the challenge, we haven't really talked much about the challenge from China's increasing digital footprint across the Indo-Pacific and the challenge from emerging critical, uh, emerging and critical technologies. Of course, the you know the Quad is is looking at these issues, but I think it would behoove us to also think about uh, the island nations and you know making sure that the U.S. and working in close partnership with uh, Japan, Australia, maybe even India. Uh, is looking at the digital development in these countries and how we can be part of that. And it gets to this subsea cable issue. Uh, we know that 99% of internet data goes across these subsea cables, so it's important for us to, to make sure that the, the U.S. Um, continues to be involved in the development of this critical infrastructure. So I, th I think we need to remember the importance of the uh, technology competition that we're facing from China. Yeah, I mean, there's backbone infrastructure, and then there's the commercial piece. Mm -hmm. And I know the Australians are attentive to that because Telstra, for instance, has been jockeying on a commercial basis mm -hmm. with Chinese players in Vanuatu for contracts mm -hmm. and for opportunities. And actually, has been doing quite well in places like Vanuatu. So um, I was going to see if there was a question from the floor, and I see Darshana Barua from Carnegie Endowment. So I've done you the favor of not having to identify yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that was a great uh, discussion. I wanted to have a question to the panel because we just launched the Indian Ocean Initiative last week. And I want to hear from you, the three of you, um, in terms of where does the Indian Ocean fit in in US priorities? I mean, the Pacific clearly is a priority. Where really is the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific for the administration generally in the gr greater scheme of things, the way US sees the world? So this is for Edgar. You're asking me for the current yeah. administration. All right, Edgar, you don't have the Indian Ocean, <laughs> but you're part of the Indo-Pacific. So where does the Indian Ocean fit in American strategic thinking in the Biden administration? I think very important. Look, I'm sure everyone paid attention. There was a lot of questions in the transition period about whether or not the Biden administration would continue to use the term Indo-Pacific. Um, and I think that the fact that the administration has embraced it, I think, is a clear sign of a recognition that this is the right framework for thinking about the region. I think that you can also see that, you know, building on the work that was on the previous administration on the Quad, the Biden administration has embraced it and taken it up to, a to from a ministerial. And I would note, you know, having been involved, Lisa was very involved, getting the first ministerial Quad was actually quite painful, um, but taking it up to a leader level. And I, it's, you know, worth giving a plug for the fact that we'll be doing the first in-person leader level Quad uh, summit at the White House on Friday. Um, so I think that that alone, I mean, you know, when you think about how hard it is to do leader level engagement in a time of COVID, um, the fact that the you know, administration and president is hosting the first in-person summit of the Quad is a sign that there's a real recognition of the importance of the Indo piece of the Indo-Pacific. But I think even more broadly than that, there is a recognition that maritime issues matter and that 
part of the longer term challenge, this goes back to the Bush administration, goes back to the Obama administration, as well as obviously the Trump administration, is that it's very much in our interest to see a much greater engagement by India and by South Asia in with East Asia. And so, you know, from our standpoint, we've been working to continue those efforts and thinking about the region as a whole. I think that the, you know, it's very clear that the Indian Ocean is tremendously important as an area and an artery of commerce. It's also tremendously important to the countries there, which are of increasing importance to us. And when we think of the region, we do think of the Indo-Pacific. You know, we have not reversed any of the changes that were made under the previous administration. If anything, I've embraced them and are seeking to expand it. Now, at the same time, it's easy to say that, and I recognize that people are looking for tangible actions. I would point to the Quad. I would point to the level of engagement and travel that you've seen to the region, including to Southeast Asia, which in some ways is the hinge that joins together um, the Indo and the Pacific. Uh, and so, you know, we recognize that it's on us to continue to demonstrate that through further efforts. But I think that you'll be seeing that and we will continue to look for ways in which we can make sure that we are expanding our engagement, being effective with our engagement, recognizing the importance of an economic component to our engagement and looking for ways to strengthen our ties with traditional partners, but also new partners. And, you know, hopefully, you know, in a year we'll have a further litany of things so that we can point to. I'm sure there will be people who will criticize us for not having done enough in some areas and others who will say we did things that we shouldn't have done. But that's the nature of the game. Uh, I think that what you will see and uh, we will follow through on is a real sustained effort to focus on what we see as a critical region for the United States in the next 50 years. Great. I know we're getting toward time, but I, I've got to ask you this question because I've been sitting here for a day and a half and it won't surprise you, Edgar, because I know you weren't here, to hear, we keep hearing about climate change. Um, it's come up from Indian Ocean Islands, it's come up from Pacific Islands. So we talked about policy continuity. Let's talk a little bit about policy volatility. Um, there is a perception that some administrations in the United States of recent decades have been more enthusiastic about climate policies, both on the supply side and on the demand side, uh, than other administrations. So in the first instance, you're dealing with a, a perception and in some cases, the reality of policy volatility. But second, in this instance, it's on an issue, climate change, climate finance, uh, multinational action to control emissions that clearly matters a lot to these particular countries and maybe more than any other issue to them because it's existential. So. Um, first, at a macro level, all three of you have been senior policymakers. How do we address the issue, not just of policy continuity, but policy volatility, because we'll switch administrations in the future, in a way that preserves a perception in these countries of long-term commitment to what matters to them, which is clearly the climate issue. And then second, for Edgar in particular, can you just say something, because I know it's on the minds of our, of our participants and guests from the Indian Ocean and from the Pacific about the climate agenda of the Biden administration and how it fits into Pacific strategy. So maybe I'll just go down the panel, start with Randy, maybe on the volatility question. Well, I think what we can't change, or at least change easily, is our domestic uh, political climate, if I could <laughs> use that word, and how these <laughs> issues are discussed domestically. What we can affect is our activities and what we do. And as I think I was saying earlier when we were chatting about this, uh, my impression has always been uh, Republicans do a little more than they're willing to talk about publicly on climate change, and Democrats probably do a little less than they advertise on climate change. And if you look at the previous administration, um, uh, COVID helped in, in a sense, but carbon emissions came down at a faster rate than had we even stayed in the Paris Agreement, right? And um, in, in, in our strategic documents, you know, people used to ask me, where'd climate change go? I said, what do you mean, where'd it go? It's in the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report. It's in our, uh, all our strategic documents, our, our national defense strategy. It's mentioned in every testimony. Um, are, are we jumping down, foot stomping and waving? No, but that's a reflection of, of domestic uh, uh, political environment and, and how we present. So I really do think it's, maybe not entirely, but largely a perception issue. And, and that's why I think we've got to be present and on the ground and, and doing a better job meeting each country's individual needs, if it's seawalls, if it's um, other things to, to enhance resiliency, other kinds of assistance to help with uh, relocation, whatever it might be. 
um, so that they see it, feel it, hear it, really, it really makes an impact. And then do a little better job messaging overall. Be a little bit more willing to talk about if you're a Republican, what you're doing. And, or a Democrat, be more realistic about, you know, sort of the overall approach. But that's, that's what I would say on it. Yeah, I, th I think that this is a tough one. I don't, I don't think there's any way to, to get around it, frankly. And you're, you're going to see broad differences, I think, between a Republican or a Democratic administration, whether the focus is on, um, you know, selling more oil uh, or, you know, developing coal resources. You, you will see differences, I think, between Republican and Democratic administrations. I mean, perhaps... Randy's point is uh, is a good one when you're talking about um, cooperation on climate technologies and some of the the uh, you know the more granular kinds of uh, cooperation that we do. But I don't think you're going to get around sort of broad differences, and that's the nature of our democracy. But I wanted to come back to the. Um, 2018 Indo-Pacific Strategic Framework. This was the framework that drove the Trump administration's policy toward the Indo-Pacific. Uh, President Trump signed it in February 2018. It was released, it was, and it was declassified and released publicly in January 2021, there for everybody to see. Um, but there was mention of working closely with the Indian Ocean region nations and building the capacity of the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh to be able to contribute to a free and open Indo-Pacific. So the, the idea was there, um, but I just think it needs to be fleshed out. And, you know, policies take time. You know, it's, it's, it's hard because you set out a policy directive, but, you know, by the time you actually get to implementing it, um, it has to span administrations. So I hope my hope is that, you know, the Biden administration will continue some of the, the policies that were identified back in 2018 uh, to drive our, our Indo-Pacific strategy. And I think I think we are seeing that by and large. You're seeing some continuity. And the Quad is a good example. Uh, yeah, the Trump administration made a lot of progress reviving the Quad in 2017 and holding you know, subsequent meetings, but it was the Biden administration that held the first ever virtual Quad Summit, now holding the first ever in-person Quad Summit. Um, so th that's a good example of continuity between the administrations. Right. Edgard, so we've had, on the climate piece specific, because we've had audience from Indian Ocean countries mm -hmm. and from Pacific countries, and they care a lot about this issue. So if you could just look straight at the camera and uh, <laughs> speak to them, not just to us, and just uh, give them a sense of what the Biden administration's climate priorities are as affects them directly. Look, I, I think the first thing is, and it will come as no surprise, you've seen the president's statements, you've seen the president's actions so far. Climate is an extraordinarily high priority for the administration. Um, and I think that this is viewed as, you know, on a number of levels. One is obviously treating it with urgency, trying to match, you know, rhetoric with action. And I totally take Randy's point um, that, you know, you've got to do that and that, you know, you know it's something where we need to follow through on what we're saying. But I think that if you look at, you know, what we, the administration is doing from rejoining the Paris Agreement to trying to, you know, create a more uh, aggressive timeline to reduce our domestic emissions, to working with um, other countries and, and so in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow, this has been a very high priority. And I assure you, we hear about this from the president. We hear about this from senior leaders in the administration all the time. So, you know, I think that the administration is very committed on this. And the president has been very clear that he sees dealing with addressing climate change as not something that is negative for the economy, but something that offers tremendous potential for the economy, both in the United States and around the world. That there are, there's the, the, the sort of transfer to a, a lower carbon future offers real economic opportunities. Um, as well as I think we have to be honest, there are inevitably going to be some costs. But I think that in the context of the degree of crisis that surrounds climate now, that you know these are things that there are the opportunities far outweigh the costs. I think in terms of the policy continuity versus discontinuity. I mean, look, I'm a career guy, and you know, gray, faceless, and boring, um, as is required by uh, that title. Um, but you know, I, I've 
dealt with climate in a, a variety of administrations. Um, and there's no question that it is much easier to deal with countries that feel an existential threat from climate change when you can explicitly acknowledge that the importance of dealing with climate change. I mean, I think that Randy's point is a very good one that, you know, what you do matters, but I think that rhetoric also matters. And I think that in this case, it makes our lives and our jobs much easier. At the same time, we have to follow through. And I think Randy's fundamental point, I think Lisa's point is exactly correct, that we need to follow through on the framework. We need to also follow through on tangible action. And we need to do things that, address real needs, both in terms of mitigation, which is a real challenge for um, island states. And I think the reality is that, you know, there's the broader question of how do you bring down global emissions um, to the point where you can stay within a 1.5 degree change. But even if you are successful, there's going to be a hell of a lot of mitigation that needs to be done. And that's something that is going to require a lot of work by the states themselves. And I think that, you know, we just need to be upfront about that as well as by their friends and supporters on the outside. Uh, but I think that, you know, in terms of the continuity, I don't have a great answer for that because I think Randy's right. And, uh, you know, that there are domestic political issues that are inevitably going to bleed over. But I think that, you know, in terms of dealing with climate, there's no question. It's much easier to work with partners who feel tremendously impacted by climate. And uh, again, for whom it's, they, they view it as existential when you can acknowledge it. And, you know, it, we need to seize on this opportunity to follow through with real action so that Randy um, is satisfied that, you know, that this administration is delivering on what it, it committed to a greater degree than he feels has been the case in the past. Okay, I ran us over time, and I know, Edgar, you gotta go. So one sentence each, just to tie it up with a bow. We've got three years to go in the Biden administration, roughly. When we get to the end of the administration, what's the one thing that is not happening now that you wish they'd do? Uh, for Randy, for Lisa, and then Edgar, you've got three years to go. What's the one thing you're not doing yet that you hope you can achieve by the end of the administration? Then we'll call time. Oh, I, I think they're largely on the right track. I mean, I think uh, there's been some significant uh, mishandling and fumbling recently, but I think on the, the Greater China Challenge and how to build partnerships and bilateral, minilateral, I think they're largely on the right track. So I would just say, uh, uh, to quote uh, the humorist um, Will Rogers, even if you're on the right track, you can get run over if you're not going fast enough. So a little more, <laughs> little more urgency and a little more uh, uh, emphasis on this. Okay, Lisa? I, I have two points. Um, one, I think that um, we can't ask these island nations to choose sides between the U.S. and China. And we need thoughtful, resourceful engagement. And, and I think we're on that track. Uh, but probably, as Randy said, we need more of that. And we need to somehow keep fighting that um, tendency to focus you know, only on the urgent. And we need to be able to, to do both, to continue to, to focus on the island nations, even when there's not a crisis. Um, second, I would just note that we have heard from several of the island nations today that they are concerned about the impact of the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. Yes. So we need to keep our eyes on the ball on extremist developments inside of these countries, whether it's Sri Lanka, Maldives, or other countries and continue to work with these countries on counterterrorism issues, because that still is a salient issue for a lot of these countries. Right, all right, Edgar, predict your legacy in three years. <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a couple of things. I mean, you know, one is if we are challenged with, okay, you've stepped things up, how will you sustain it? That will be a good problem to have. Um, you know, if we if we are able, if the issue starts to be how do we institutionalize and how do we sustain a greater set of efforts, that will be a sign that we've managed to increase our efforts. Now, um, I think that the other things are I hope you know I expect we will have um, extended the compacts. We will have had uh, regular and sustained high level engagement with leaders uh, from the islands uh, and that we will have uh, expanded our presence and engagement in a meaningful way and that we'll have worked with them on how better to manage um, their EEZs and to better have, better make sure that they are the ones who are getting the benefits um, of the vast uh, maritime areas where they have economic um, sway. 
And if we can do those things and at the same time have found a way to work with our allies and partners, and to work with new partners, and I should note in that regard that we are looking to start talking to India, which has a smaller traditional role in the Pacific, um, but obviously has a great, very significant role in the Indian Ocean about how we can expand what the, the very good work that was done under Lisa's leadership um, and Randy's as well. I think all those things, if we can do those things, we will have been successful. I think that if Four years from now, we are talking about, you know, how we can find a way to show that we're engaged, then we will have failed. So, you know, the key is that we need to be, we need to have the debate be about sustaining what we've stepped up to. And you to, I hate to use the word step up um, to suggest that we're copying Australia. But what we will, what we've aspired to, if we can be transitioning to sustain it, we'll have done a good job. All right, very well put. So to the audience in the room and out of the room, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, to those who missed it, you can go back and watch it. Edgar, I know you got the quad, you got AUKUS, you're a busy guy, so we really appreciate your time. And to Lisa and Randy, it's always fun to see you guys. So thank you, and please join me in thanking the panel. Uh, we are almost at the end of it. Uh, you gave us day and a half to listen to these discussions, give us about 10 minutes to thank the people who really have made it possible uh, for this dialogue to happen. Uh, I will first turn to our partners at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation who is joining us very early in the morning about 5.45 a.m. in Tokyo uh, to share with our uh, virtual and, and with all of you here in the room uh, a vote of thanks from, uh, from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation um, as soon as she's here on the screen. And then I will just take a minute to thank the people uh, who's made it possible, especially in a challenging time, uh, like uh, in the ones that we are here. Um, I will just wait as soon as she's here, I'll turn it over. Shana-san, we can see you. Please go ahead. Uh, All right. All right. Yes. Thank you, Dara Shana-san, for your kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I am Junko Chana of the Saska Peace Foundation, based in Tokyo, and speaking from Tokyo today. As a co-organizer of this uh, event, I feel honored to make a few remarks in closing the very first dialogue that featured Pacific island nations and also Indian oceans, uh, Indian uh, island nations in the Indian Ocean, sorry. In looking back, it was almost two years ago when I learned about this idea of in, uh, dialogue. Uh, Darshana now is at Carnegie, was with us in Japan as a visiting fellow, conducting research on the island nations in the Indian Ocean. And I immediately embraced her idea Partly because the Saska Peace Foundation has a strong program called Pacific Island Nations Fund, working in the region for over 30 years. And some of the current project includes a Coast Guard project in the Micronation region that started from donating patrol boats by the Nippon Foundation. And now the Saska Peace Foundation are providing training programs for these people. Another project we are are hoping to resume is the one to develop and promote environmentally friendly community-based tourism in Palau. But more importantly, however, through these works, I have learned the key for success lies in our willingness to respect the thinking of the people, their values and cultures, and to work together with these nuances and understandings. And this notion strongly resonated with the core of this dialogue, spotlighting island nations for all of us to think how we can work together. Also looking at this dialogue more closely, I realize climate change to be an important underlying concept that shapes discussions on every issue, starting from security concerns, blue economy, developmental issues, and so on. As a matter of fact, 
the United Nations note, climate change as a defining crisis of our time. And it calls for bold collective action, saying that no other, uh, no corner of the globe is immune from the devastating consequences. And I, then I realize that our dialogue targets at issues of the island nations, but these issues go beyond and start addressing concerns that we all face today. And this is one thing that I'd like to take away from this conference. Also, I certainly appreciated the sessions that shares with us uh, insights of non-islanders, if you will. And hopefully the next time, we shall have more dialogue between islanders and non-islanders together on the, on the podium and talking about their issues. Now, I am most grateful to all the ministers, ambassadors, and distinguished experts and guests for your engaged discussions with great candor and sincerity. I also would like to thank Japan Society New York, led by Josh Walker, for kindly working with us and accommodating some of the changes to cope with COVID. But let me also congratulate Darshana, Evan, and the staff at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for successfully organizing this dialogue. You encountered so many uncertainties and you pulled through from them. Congratulations and thank you very much for doing this. This dialogue is ending, but issues laid out today are far from concluding. And therefore, I'd like to echo Darshana, who has said in this uh, dialogue several times that this dialogue to be continued, perhaps on a yearly basis. And I hope the next time I'll be able to see you in person. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you so much, uh, Charles. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank uh, all the people behind it. It's never easy to start a dialogue, least of it in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, I wanted to start this. Um, I have gotten a lot of shout outs from Evin, from Sasakawa for pulling this together. But my shout out goes to three people who have been behind this. And I don't think so this would have been possible. Uh, Catherine Buchanan, Catherine Hockman, and Alex Taylor, who's been working with me endlessly for over the last four to five months, and I think they do deserve a big round of applause uh, for bringing us all here together to put this, for the first time probably in about 18 months to, and, and making this a reality. Um, I also want to thank um, Caroline Duckworth and, and Cliff Jayapranada, who are with us from the DC team here. Uh, the Japan Society, as um, uh, Chano-san mentioned, Joshua Walker, but the team led by uh, Lydia Gulick and Carmen and Ben, who made sure that this was possible in a safe, uh, um, in a safe way that does not impact or does not, at least, does not uh, exaggerate the um, issues of the pandemic that we face today. Um, uh, for the virtual participants, um, I, we have re already received a lot of great feedback on the way it was conducted, how, how accessible this was. This was truly because of the technological team and the communications team. So thank you so much to Taka Akiando, who's right up there, <laughs> and your team for pulling this through for this virtual participants that we have already have over 500, 600 views, and I think this will continue to rise. Um, the team, the communications team in back in DC who has really been pushing this out and making sure the policymakers and the leaders that we were able to bring to the stage today, it reaches the right people across the Indo-Pacific, led, uh, led by Doug Ferrer, but Jessica Katz, uh, Fiona Gorillo, uh, Jocelyn Soli, Amy Mellon, um, and, and others are um, uh, in, in DC. Thank you to the Sasagawa Peace Foundation, of course, for the partnership. But let me thank Evan Fagenbaum and Ashley Tellis for the support that we have received over this initiative. Indian Ocean does not get, or the Indo-Pacific, um, or the islands part of the Indo-Pacific does not really get the attention or the due credit it deserves in discussing the geopolitics of today. It takes a lot for an institution like Carnegie uh, to give that space, to give that, give that support, and for that, I'm very grateful. I've only arrived four months ago, 
So this was a big thing to pull through, and I could not have done that without that support. I also want to take a minute to thank Milan Vaishnav, who is the director of uh, the South Asia program, and Zainab Usman, who's with her, our brand new director of the Africa program, who's uh, come here to do this with us in, in, this, in these times. Thank you for all of you who's joined us, made time to be here, listen, engage, and participate to all of the speakers and to all of the ministers and the ambassadors who joined. Uh, Randy, Lisa, Edgar, of course, the virtual participants as well as well, um, and everyone else who's listening in. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you the next time. Thank you. Thank you.